this afternoon. So um, you continue lecture two. And yesterday, I, uh, the last part of the, the talk, I introduced a strategy to address the problem of uh, constructing uh, solutions to the Hempel equation, which is our model equation in this course, uh, which exhibits uh, a component of the nodal set uh, with some prescribed topology. So the component of the nodal set is distributed to a given hypersurface. The strategy, as I explained uh, yesterday, uh, consists of two steps. In the first step, uh, we construct uh, a local solution in a neighborhood of the given hypersurface. A local solution to our model equation, in this case, Hempel's equation, such that the hypersurface is exactly the zero set of this local solution. This was the first step. And uh, how to implement uh, this step? Maybe you can use Cauchy Kovalevsky theorem or an appropriately chosen boundary value problem. It depends on the, on the equation and on the kind of surface, the fact that you want to realize, etc. And second, in the second step, you want to globalize this local solution. So you have the local solution defined in a neighborhood or in an open set containing your hypersurface, and you want to prove that there exists a global solution, a solution defined in whole Euclidean space, which is uh, not uh, an extension of the local solution because this is not possible in general, but at least it's very close to the local solution in the, in the neighborhood of the, of the set, of the hypersurface. And close is an appropriate sense, for example, in the C1 norm or, or some other norm. So, uh, for the success of this strategy, I said that we need uh, to control the structural stability of the nodal set of the local solution. Why? Because uh, we are approximating the local solution by a global solution, and uh, we want to guarantee that uh, the global solution has a nodal set or a component of the nodal set which is uh, diffeomorphic uh, to the nodal set of the local solution. So uh, for this reason, we want uh, that, the, that the, the local solution has a nodal set which is stable under perturbations. Okay? So for this, <coughs> uh, I said that there is a, a technique or a theorem that uh, provides uh, sufficient conditions for a structural stability of the zero set of a function. That is Tom's theorem. So now in, the, in this first part of lecture two, I'm going to state uh, Tom's theorem, explain the, a bit its content <clears throat> and a bit of its proof, although I'm not going to prove it. And, uh, and then after that, I'll, I'll pass to the, to the global uh, approximation theorem. Okay, so, so let's first state uh, Tom's theorem. So it appears in a paper <coughs> by Tom, published in 1954, and it provides its uh, sufficient condition sufficient condition for uh, for structural stability. stability means that uh, any other function which is close enough to your original function has a level set which is diffeomorphic to the original level set. This is the meaning of the structural stability. <coughs> so Tom's theorem says the following. It's, uh, I'm going to state it for compact uh, level sets, <coughs> although there is a version for non-compact, but it's more complicated. <coughs> so. In general, uh, we consider uh, a map from Rn to Rm, and bigger, sticky than m. In our particular case, uh, in this course, I will apply 
this theorem when m is equal to 1, that's one function, or when m is equal to 2. In, in lecture 4, <coughs> I, will, uh, I will talk about uh, intersection of level sets. So in this case, this will be uh, m equal to 2. But uh, at this moment, uh, you can think of m being equal to 1. And consider uh, sigma a connected component component of the zero level set OB, which is compact. Okay. <clears throat> then the important condition in this theorem is that is that the rank of the of the gradient of the differential of this function B is maximal on sigma. That is, that the, the rank of the gradient of, say, B1 Bm, where this uh, B1 Bm are the m components of this map, okay. the rank of this matrix on this component is maximal. So that is, it's equal to m, is the maximum number. Okay? Then, Then, if you have a function u that is close <coughs> to b in the C1 norm, u is ck close to b, k bigger or equal than 1, in a neighborhood of sigma. There exists a diffeomorphism P from our end to itself such that <clears throat> the image of sigma by the diffeom is a component of the zero set of U. Geomorphism is also close to the identity. Other is uh, CK phi is CK close <coughs> to the identity. And actually, it's different from the identity only in a neighborhood of sigma. So, away from sigma or away from some neighborhood of sigma, this differs exactly the identity. You can construct it to be exactly the identity. So, different from the identity. study the, uh, the perturbations of a function, uh, and what you want to analyze is the zero set. I say the zero set, of course, uh, zero is not important here, it could be any other level set, but uh, in these uh, lectures we are interested only in the, on the nodal set. So that's why I'm focusing on zero here. So if we have a function V, which is uh, a map from Rn to Rm, you can understand this as M functions, M, M real value functions, okay? And you consider a connected component of the zero set of this map, which is compact, you assume compactness of this component, okay? And then you assume another condition, which is the really important condition here. You assume that it's, this component is regular. It's, it's a regular, or uh, that, that uh, it's a regular uh, value for the, of this function. So this means that the rank 
of the gradient of these uh, m functions here, v1, vm, m to vm components, is maximal on the on sigma. So the differential uh, at each point, the differential of the Jacobian matrix of this at each point of sigma is on to is surjective. Okay? On the normal plane to the to, to this sigma. So in, in particular this implies that the collimation of sigma is equal to n. Or in other words, the dimension is equal to n minus m. Okay, this, uh, this condition. You have the maximality of the normal bundle, maximality of the rank of the differential. So then, with this condition, what we get is that for any any other u, which is uh, any other function, any other map from Rn to Rm, which is close enough to, to be in a neighborhood of so sigma, <clears throat> then this function u has indeed uh, a, a component of its nodal set, which is diffeomorphic to sigma. There exists this diffeo, and this diffeo is, uh, is close to the set. Okay. And in fact, uh, you can construct it so that it's uh, the identity away from some neighborhood of the, of the component. Okay. So this is the statement of Tom's theorem. If you look at the original paper, probably it will be hard to find the, the statement. It's not so easy because it's a very, very long paper and uh, it's, uh, it's complicated to read it. But uh, for example, there is a, a book where you can but there are many places where this has been revisited, and there are nowadays many proofs of this. And uh, a nice uh, book where you can find also Tom's uh, theorem, which is called actually in the literature uh, Tom's isotopic theorem. Uh, it also appears in a book uh, by Abraham and Robin. in the 60s. So uh, <clears throat> the idea of this theorem, of the proof, uh, I'm not going to prove it, although it's not very hard. Uh, actually, it's, a, it's a more or less a, a consequence of the implicit function theorem. So the idea is the following. You have to, so let's focus on, on some piece of sigma. So this, uh, this line here, uh, assume that it's a, a piece of sigma. Then you want, uh, so it is, uh, it is a part of the pseudo set of your function P, and now you perturb B. So <clears throat> in the perturbation, what you analyze is uh, what happens with the pseudo set of U in the neighborhood of sigma, and actually on the intersection of the pseudo set of U with the normal planes to sigma. So let's consider. At each point, at each point of uh, sigma, consider the normal planes, okay? And now analyze the zero set of this of this function u in the neighborhood. So it will be something like this, for example. Okay. <coughs> so <coughs> in the theorem, what you actually prove is that. Uh, this condition allows you to apply the implicit function theorem so that you can prove that the intersection at each point, so at each point, each point x of sigma, the intersection of u minus 1, 0 with <clears throat> with the with the normal plane and x, so let's say, for example, at this particular point x, the normal plane and x consists just of uh, one point. Okay, and this is implied by the implicit function theorem. So this is the rank condition. This rank condition 
and an application of the implicit, implicit function here. So with this property, you can construct the, the diffeomorphism. How? Just yes, uh, say pushing. Uh, so you construct a normal field which uh, pushes your yellow uh, surface, which is the component of U. So the yellow, the yellow would be the U minus one zero, and then you can construct a, a vector field and then a flow pushing the yellow over the, the white along the normal. Okay, simply like this. And this is the, the diffeomorphism. So the diffeo phi is just uh, essentially pushing this intersection onto the corresponding point along the The normal plane. Something like this. So this is more or less the idea. Just, just I, I wanted to explain this uh, to you, just to show that uh, actually it's a quite natural uh, result. It's not. Uh, it's essentially an application of the implicit function theorem to this context. Yes. The paper is wrong. No, the paper is not wrong. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. It's uh, no. The, the point is that. It's not stated state exactly this way. Uh, and uh, okay, if you read the, the whole paper, you can see that it's there. But it's not uh, okay. It's an old paper, so it doesn't have a theory with exactly this uh, statement. You have to read everything to see. Okay, if you understand this 80 pages paper, you can prove this uh, quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of this. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, nowadays it's quite standard, but uh, the origin, of course, is almost uh, the well. So, this is, uh, and uh, we will simply apply the, the theorem in, in our in these lectures because uh, this is the context that we'll have. We'll have the local solution D with a controlled uh, nodal set, and we will approximate by a global solution, which will be this U. And uh, this, approxim this approximation will be in CK norm, okay, in the name of this. <coughs> so then with this theorem, if we are able to check this condition for the local solution, if this condition holds, then we will be able to ensure that your global solution has uh, a nodal set, a component of the nodal set, which is diffeomorphic to the C. So this will be just application. We will invoke the theorem. Not, uh, we don't do not give, need to use this proof or any technique. I mean, it's just the evocation. Of this. So, so now just a, a remark about uh, the non-compact case. So, uh, as I stated, this is false for. Uh, if you assume, if you drop this condition, if you have a component non-compact and you want to ensure structural stability, this condition is not enough. This condition is not enough. Okay, you have examples where this condition is satisfied, when, but when you perturb your function, the nodal set changes to poly. Okay. So the point is that uh, you can prove an analogous theorem for the non-compact case. So, so a generalization exists for non-compact nodal set. And here, essentially, uh, the idea is uh, that this is not enough, but what is enough is that uh, the into, for example, in the case that m is equal to 1, where you just have one function, so you be a function from Rn to R, then the good condition here uh, will be that, not that the, so this condition would mean that the, 
it means that the gradient of V is not zero, the gradient of V at X is not zero uh, for any point X on sigma. This is this condition, right? right? The run condition, the maximum run condition when M is equal to one is that the gradient is different from zero on sigma. This is not enough, this is not the good condition. You need uh, something else, you need more. You need that the infimum, the infimum of the gradient of V at each point of sigma is positive. So you don't want that the gradient be non-zero but tending to zero at infinity. You need this, at least, plus other things, plus bounds, you need some bounds on, uh, say, on C2 north. Okay. So with some appropriate bounds, you can prove an analogous theorem to this setting. So you need the, the you need this first condition. This is more or less natural uh, because um, because you want to exclude critical points at infinity. Critical points at infinity could come from infinity to the finite plane. That's the problem. You could have a saddle. You could have a saddle at infinity. So let's think of this picture. So let's think of this the level sets of a function, which are some kind of parabolas. And here they break and they become two two lines. Okay. So you can think as if this were a saddle at infinity. The standard saddle, the standard finite saddle, is something like this. Okay. So push this point at infinity, you would get this picture. Okay, but what 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 happens or could happen uh, in this case is that the gradient you could have that this object has gradient non vanishing, but uh, the gradient tends to zero at infinity. And then when you part off, you can bring into the plane this critical point at infinity. There are many examples of this construction. Okay, mm -hmm. and this could change the, the topology of the object. So you want, you want to exclude this with this condition, and moreover, since you construct a flow using some vector field, some normal vector field, you want, you need only some bounds uh, to control uh, that what you construct is really a, a good flow, etc. That's why you need this sort of technical assumption on on the on higher derivatives. Okay. But um, actually, in this course, we don't need the, this extension because uh, I'll always consider uh, compact uh, nodal sets. You need this, for example, if you want to study the level sets of the, the nodal sets of, uh, of harmonic functions, which are uh, necessarily uh, non-compact. Okay. Mm -hmm. But just simply a, a comment about uh, that this exists. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so now we can go to Runge's theorem. So if there are some questions, please interrupt me, no problem. I'd be glad uh, to answer you. The dimension is n minus m, exactly. So in our case, n minus 1, in the case that uh, most of these lectures. Then the image is a component of the zero set of u. So we start with a component of v. We perturb v. u is the perturbation of v. U is the perturbation of V. And we infer that this condition implies that U itself, U itself has a component with zero set, uh, which is uh, diffeomorphic to sigma. That's the specific claim of the theorem. And we will involve it. This is just the invocation of the, the theorem in the lecture. So this is the statement. So now let's go to the to the second technique. I said that we will need two techniques or two theorems. This is the first one. This ensures structural stability. This ensures that the zero set of your local solution will persist when you perturb it. And now uh, we want to to study uh, this globalization, this 
it's true that even a local solution, so BDE, well, from this to this BDE, the Hempel equation, it can be approximated by a global Okay, so Runge's theorem. So, oh, okay, Tom's theorem establishes uh, this sufficient condition. And the norm, the good norm, is C1. CK, K bigger or equal than 1. So, our Runge theorem must provide, uh, must give uh, a globalization or an approximation, at least in C1, because if it's uh, if it's not in a good enough norm, uh, you cannot apply your structural stability theory. So we, we need to prove a Runge's theorem, which ensures that there is a global solution approximating the local one, at least in C1 norm. So this is the theorem. Theorem, the Runge type. Global approximation. Just for the Hempel equation, as I said, it's only for the equation Laplacian of u plus u equals zero. Okay, although it holds in much, much, much more generality. So this is the theorem. So we have a local solution. Let B be a, a solution. For the equation, the expression of B plus B equal to zero in a compact set. By a solution in a closed set, as usual, I mean uh, a solution in an open set containing the closed set. That's uh, the usual uh, meaning of, of having a PDE which is solved in a, in a closed set. So this means actually that um, there is a, that the B solves the PDE. In some open neighborhood, open neighborhood, let's call it N of K. Okay. This is just uh, the definition of a solution being uh, satisfied in a closed set. Okay. So, and uh, this uh, set does not need to be connected. Not necessarily connected. Okay. Although uh, I'll apply it. Uh, no, no, I'll not. I, I'll, I'll use uh, this extent, this uh, this theorem for non non connected uh, compact sets. Because I want to prescribe several components, not only one. If you want to prescribe only one, you connect it, it's okay, but not in general. Now, uh, there is an important uh, condition, uh, topological condition on the set, which is that suppose that the complement of k, Rn minus k, is connected. Complement is okay. This is an important uh, assumption okay. for any Runge type theory. I'll 
tell you why now in a couple of minutes. Then the claim is that there exists a solution U of temple in Euclidean space, the whole the polar end, which actually is not any solution, it's a, it's a solution which decays pointwise, which falls off at infinity. This way, uh, it's uh, not only the solution, but all all derivatives are bounded this way. Okay, so there is a solution to this equation, which decays pointwise this way, and which approximates. Uh, B as, uh, so in the CK norm, as um, U minus B, if you control, if you measure the CK norm of U minus B in your set, in your compact set, this is smaller, small than, for example, you pick a delta and you get this. Okay. So, so this is the statement of the theorem. So, Let's uh, go over it. So we have, uh, we are given a solution to the Hempel equation, which is defined uh, in a neighborhood of a compact set K. Okay. Not necessarily connected, this set. And uh, here the important assumption is that the complement of K is not connected. So for example, um, I would say so if our set K is this, then this is OK, because the complement, let's think of R2, just the blackboard, and this, uh, this deformed ball, the blackboard there, of course, the complement is connected. But uh, a, a bad situation is an analog, for example. And if you have uh, this compact set, Then the theorem does not apply here because you have two components. You have here, this one is compact, and you have this other one. And this is crucial. This, this assumption cannot be avoided. It's, uh, without this, you have counterexamples. You have local solutions that cannot be globalized. And you'll see in the procedure why, because there are some singularities that you want to get rid of them. Uh, and, and if in the complement you cannot push your singularities to infinity, uh, then the singularities, for example, in this case, will, uh, will stay in this compact region. <coughs> so it will not be a global, solution, a global solution. It will be a solution with singularities. So this is important. <coughs> This already appears in the classical Runge theorem. Classical Runge theorem is a, Runge, is a theorem in complex analysis. Classical Runge. It's a global approximation for holomorphic functions. Maybe you, you've studied this in a time course on complex analysis. So this is classical Runge. This is a global approximation theorem. Holomorphic functions. Defined uh, in some compact set of the complex plane. Okay? And the condition in this theorem is exactly the same as this. The condition, crucial condition. Is that the complement of K, uh, of K yes, in the complex the complex plane must be connected. Okay, so here is the thing. Then the, the claim is that there exists a global solution to the equation 
uh, is not any solution. You control something about the growth of the solution at infinity. You can ensure that it decays. The decay is optimal, actually, for the Hempel equation. This decay, so it's uh, so it's uh, x to the power n minus one over two in the particular case of n equal three, which is a, a case that you must have in mind to, to understand uh, these things. It's just one over x, okay. and this is optimal. Okay. This meaning that you cannot have solutions to handle which is okay. Yes. So the class of linear cases happens in a like poly by polynomial. Polynomial. But yeah. in, so it goes infinity when x goes to infinity. But in this case, you can control. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, in, in the classical. Uh, uh, yes, in the, in the classical generalizations of Runge to PDEs, uh, in general you cannot control growth at infinity. Yes. Uh, for the for the case of holomorphic functions, uh, having a polynomial is not so bad because you cannot have a bounded holomorphic function. <laughs> it would be a constant. Uh, so that's not uh, so bad. But uh, if you apply the procedure, this procedure uh, for more generalistic PDEs, actually. Uh, you get some uh, singularities at infinity in some sense, so you, you get that it's not bounded. So here you prove more, yeah, you, you can control that, you, you see why you can do this. For the Hempel equation, this is very, very, very specific for Hempel equation and some other PDEs, but not uh, many of them. Okay, for, for many PDEs, uh, elliptic, linear, you have a global approximation. But only for very few of them, you can control growth at infinity. And for this one of these cases. Okay. And uh, actually, this is a particular case of something that uh, I'll mention more about this uh, later. Yes, at this moment, I want to write some name here. Which this uh, again, uh, this uh, uh, or, or this is a particular case of a solution of, of some type of solution of Hempel, which is called Hempel's. Solutions, headless waves, or headless solution. Okay. It's a particular case of solution to Hempel. So, actually, headless, so this is more actually than headless because uh, in headless solutions, you don't have point wise decay, you have some kind of average decay. Mm. Okay, I'll write it uh, later. So, here you have more, you have point wise decay. And, uh, and this, this u approximates d in the in, uh, CK norm. So here you fix any k, a priori, if you want to be more precise. So fix uh, k integer and delta positive. And for any fixed k and delta, you get this approximation. Okay? So this is a solution for any uh, integer k and any. So now I'm going to spend the, uh, the rest of the lecture approving this result. In, uh, yes. in the master theorem, the magic sigma didn't is so smooth. So even in the master theorem, the magic sigma sigma is in the master theorem. In the, the first theorem. Ah, the first theorem. Yeah. 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 yeah, the sigma we need. Uh, oh, sigma, sigma is a small. Yeah. It's very small, so then any k. Uh, yeah, 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 any k that you want. Yeah, okay. <coughs> yeah. And actually, you with k equal 1, it's okay. Just sit down. Yeah, actually, the solution, uh, this local solution will be always smooth. Well, actually, more analytically. So, uh, your sub manifolds, your sigma, which is a nodal set of these uh, V without critical points, this will be analytic, actually. So, let's prove, before proving this, uh, so if there are other questions, so can, can you understand the statement of the, of the theorem? It's just simply, it's uh, what. Uh, so in, in, in differential topology or differential geometry, 
what one does is to extend things. You use uh, expansion theorems like Whitney or <coughs> other people, and you extend your local function by a global function. And it's just an extension. The restriction of your global function to k is exactly equal to b. In p, this you can't do this in general, of course, so this is the, the natural uh, analogy uh, with the procedure in geometry. You don't have extension, but at least you have approximation. So to prove this theorem, just I need the annotation, which is uh, this function, the following function. It's a uh, function g of x, which is the following. So here, this function, this beta is some constant, which is explicit, it's an explicit constant. I'm not going to write it, it depends on n. It's an explicit constant. Uh, it involves the area of the unit n minus one dimensional spheres and gamma functions, but it's explicit constant. Explicit constant. I don't need its, uh, its expression. And this why here? This is the Bessel function. This y is Bessel function of second kind. Okay. So, why is this function important? The point is that this is actually the Green's function or a Green's function with pole at the origin for this operator, for the Laplacian plus one. So this is a Green's function. Green's function, all at zero. The origin of the Laplacian plus one. Okay? So then now I skip a few details. This will be assignments for students and exercises. So first, uh, the exercise just prove that if you apply Laplacian plus one to this G here, you obtain in the sense of distributions the delta, the delta distribution uh, at the origin. Okay, just prove this. And also uh, prove uh, the asymptotics of this. So when x tends to zero, you have the same asymptotics as the, as the standard uh, Green's function uh, for the Laplacian. So just when dx is equal to minus 1 over the dimension of the n minus 1 sphere, the, the, the area. N minus one unit sphere. Okay, for this you need uh, to write explicitly this beta. And uh, over x to the power m minus two. Okay. When x tends to zero. But plus higher order terms. <coughs> okay. So just uh, do it. Uh, so just an exercise to work with. Uh, you've worked probably uh, in your courses on PDEs or uh, with the Green's function for the Laplacian, the standard Green's function. So now you just simply to work with this and just to use properties of this special function, this Bessel function. And uh, for example, just to have in mind what this object uh, looks like, this is just for n equal three. This is you can write. This explicitly, this is simply minus cosine of x over 4 pi x. Okay, this is simply this for n equal to. So uh, you you can have in mind just uh, n equal three uh, picture of the of this function, which uh, as you see there is an important difference with the standard with the Green's function of Laplacian, the Green's 
function of Laplacian has sign in R3. Uh, here there is no sign because this oscillates, okay? And uh, this is because of this one, of course, here. And um, this is uh, this will be important in the argument of the proof. And now I want to prove the theorem. Okay, so so that's uh, this uh, definition. And now I can start the proof. <laughs> last day, I love you. <laughs> so proof. Okay. So first, I'm going to extend uh, the function b. So recall, you, you have a function b defined on so b. B is given. B is uh, defined. On uh, this neighborhood n containing k. Okay. Now I extend it just by brute force. I'm going to consider a cutoff function. So consider a cutoff function g, which is simply this is equal to one. On K and it will be smooth, smooth cutoff function which is equal to 1 on K and 0 on the complement of N. Okay, and you interpolate between 1 and 0 uh, smooth. Yes, a function, any one is good. And you define this object, this function, U1 is defined. <coughs> Is an extension, is a brute force extension of B, is that C times B. Okay? If you want, you can uh, uh, to say that U1 is equal to 0 in the complement of Rn minus N. Okay? So this is a smooth function. Okay? You see the cut of B is defined in the neighborhood, and now you multiply it by the function which is identically 0 on the complement of A. So this U1 will be identically seen on the complement of A. Okay, uh, this, is, uh, this is an extension of U function B, but of course it doesn't solve the PD. If you apply uh, the operator, Laplacian plus 1 on this function U1, what you get is not zero, it's some, uh, some density. Mm, with sign, uh, some f, say, which is uh, something that is supported, it's supported in a very localized uh, place, uh, which is uh, the region between uh, k and n. So that's so the picture is uh, so you have to you have k, you have a, an open set containing k where the PB is solved. And then, since your function, this u1 is equal to 0 here and is equal to b here, the mass uh, or the density, this uh, density with time f, is just supported here in this frame. Uh, 
solution to the homogeneous equation plus some particular solution solving this uh, with this f. So you can write u1 this way. You can write u this u1 as h, which will be a solution to the homogeneous equation. It will solve the Laplacian plus one acting on h is equal to zero. The solution to the homogeneous some h plus the following object plus a u u prime one, which is defined using the Green's function. Using the Green's function, it will be a function such that when we act on it, the Laplacian plus one, it will give f. And it, this is precisely the integral on Rn, the convolution of Green's function with f. Minus y, the convolution of uh, Green's function with f. Okay, and this is completely supported, this f in this region, this is pretty, pretty well defined. Okay, so now we have written u1 this way. So this part here, this is good, this solves the PDE, maybe zero, but, uh, well, it's not zero in general, but okay, it could be zero, but uh, in any case, whatever it, this be, uh, this solves the PDE globally. But we have this u prime one, which contains the mass. Okay. So now, next step is uh, trying to improve, uh, uh, trying to substitute this u prime one by some other function, which is better in the sense that, uh, in the sense of the PDE. So let's do the following. So, okay, so now we, are, we approximate this integral by Riemann sums. We approximate u prime 1 by Riemann sums. There are many ways of uh, understanding what I'm going to do now. Either you can understand simply as the approximation of an integral by, uh, by the Riemann, by the standard Riemann procedure of cutting the, your support in the small pieces and then uh, substituting, substituting some by integral by sum, or uh, another way is just using a partition of unity to integrate on a small ball. Another way is just understanding, is just having this, uh, understanding this fy dy as a signed uh, finite measure on here, and any signed finite measure can be approximated by sums of delta measures. So you can, uh, you, uh, you can uh, approximate this by sums of delta, delta functions. In any case, what you get is uh, another function u prime you choose, sorry, you choose x, which is defined this way. Okay. Where these points x and are contained n minus k, and this uh, this c n are real constants. Okay. And this function u2, if this m is large enough, and this is uh, this constant, and these points are chosen in the good way, this approximates uniformly u prime one. So such that if you compute the difference u prime one and u2, and you and you study or you compute the supremum, the c zero c zero norm. Okay, this is a small, smaller than delta. Okay, for any delta, there exists a partition of this, uh, which uh, gives you this approximation. Okay. So you follow the, what we are doing, just simply approximating the integral by Riemann sums. Okay. So what we have done in some sense is this: we have discretized the, the support is a continuum. And now we have discretized it. 
Okay, now your your new function, so your new function u2, it solves the PD in the whole space except for finitely many singularities, discrete singularities. So you have your, your set k, and u, and we have substituted the support of the of this Laplacian plus one, this f, the support of this f was uh, was contained was a continuum contained uh, here in this analysis. Now the support just consists of uh, finitely many points for this u two. Okay. And you have uniform approximation because your poles, uh, your uniform approximation <coughs> in, in k. Uh, because your poles don't touch K. That's why you can do it. Okay, this is what you have here. Yeah. What? <laughs> Too many points. <laughs> well, but probably there are many because we want to. Then that's more, so let's, <laughs> let's draw a bit more. <laughs> okay. So we have this, uh, <laughs> this approximation. Okay, so have we gained uh, something? Okay, now we have a function u2. u2, uh, which, uh, okay, I'm going to use uh, for the moment uh, the C0 norm. Uh, at the end of the day, I will promote to see k or finalistic uh, estimates. But uh, even you can do the, at this moment with ck because you take derivatives and you can, and, and of course uh, this behaves pretty well with respect to derivatives. But okay, let's do things in the easier way and just uh, the easy thing, of course, is just uniform approximation. So what can we do now? Now there is a now we're going to to do magic which is I'm going to move the poles. This is probably the, the most magical part of the proof, and the, the part that, uh, okay, it can be understood in the sense that uh, the proof is right, I hope, <laughs> but um, you, don't, um, you don't see it, or it's not constructive in some sense. It, I'm going to invoke a functional analysis theorem, Hambana, and this kind of theorem, okay, gives you Existence of things, and, but you don't really see, or you can't really construct. It's not very constructive. So that's the next step, and the next step is actually the following claim. So for the next claim, I need uh, again some notation. So assume. Uh, so let's take a ball. Let V R a ball, big ball, which contains. The closure of this uh, N. Then the claim is the following okay. is that there exists a set of points, set of points X prime N. equal 1 to m prime, so in general more than m, bigger than m, uh, contained in the complement of the ball, okay. and, and constant c prime n, real constants, Such that the following function, the function u3 at point x, which is defined as the sum of, uh, of Green's functions with poles at these points, x prime, is defined this way. It's the sum from n equal to 1 to n prime of c prime n times the Green's function with pole at x prime n. 
such that this object here, this U3, approximates uniformly U2 in K. Approximates, can you see from there, uh, this, at this uh, height, yeah? <laughs> such that this approximates, approximates U2 in K as a uniform approximation. U2 minus U3 C0K is smaller than delta. Okay? So, what am I doing here? I am moving the poles. So, let's... Um, I claim that I can move the poles. I can push them away from the from the R ball, for, from this ball, and this new uh, configuration of uh, charges produces a potential which is almost the same as the potential produced by this configuration of charges. So it's uh, pictorially you have uh, you have the ball, you have the ball BR, and here let's uh, you can even fix uh, the set where you want to push the poles, uh, and the claim is that in this set, which is in the complement of the ball, Okay, now I should spend more time because <laughs> probably there are more points here than before. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there are <laughs> sufficiently many points here such that the potential created by this here in, in K is almost the same, is uniformly close to the original potential uh, in K. And this works for any, this is not only for Helmholtz, this is quite, quite general. This is for harmonic functions and very general linear. PDEs, also parabolic PDEs. So, so this is this procedure is called in the literature using a French word. It's called uh, balayage of points. Balayage. Which means that you are sweeping the the poles. Or by or balayage, or balayage of poles. Okay. So, <coughs> so I'm going to prove this claim. equation is easier uh, than in the than in the general case uh, because for because of two reasons first uh, because the solutions to Helmholtz equation are real analytic this does not happen if you have a, a general elliptic operator with uh, with non analytic coefficients they are not but then you substitute in the general setting you substitute analyticity by unique continuation that would be okay it's a bit more sophisticated but you have something is analogous in some sense. And second here is also easier because uh, you have that this that the Green's function of the of your operator Laplacian plus one or because the operator Laplacian plus one is is uh, is symmetric or formally symmetric. So the adjoint is the same. So then this means that the Green's function of the adjoint of the operator and of the operator is the same is the same. So you have symmetry uh, g of x, y, and g of y, x is the same. In general, this is not the case, uh, but uh, you can. Uh, but then you, you can. What you do is uh, you use. Uh, you, you have to work with all, also with the adjoint operator, and uh, you can do something similar. But here, are these two facts: the symmetry of the Green's function with respect to the two entries, and the analyticity will simplify the proof a bit. Okay. So. So, in the proof of this uh, lemma, okay, or of this claim, uh, let's start. 
start defining certain <coughs> space, so we define a new, this new will be this space of finite, finite linear combinations, linear combinations as uh, these ones here. So I'm going to this is, let's call this star. So this star means uh, this. So finite linear combinations of Green's functions with poles. Say let's let's take here some uh, some u contained in the complement of the ball. Okay, fix uh, you fix uh, fix u here, and then you define the space of find linear combinations of Green's functions with poles uh, here. Okay. This, this will be new. Okay. So, of course, when you restrict, since your poles are away from K, new on K, this is contained in the space of continuous functions. So now I'm going to use, uh, I said this Hambanach theorem, so I'm going to, to use the fact that the dual, the dual space of continuous functions, the dual of continuous functions, okay, is the space of finite measures with sign, because this, this, these are not positive, don't need to be positive, these have sign, so in general, you need to include sign measures. Is the space of um, space n k n k of finite sign or L measures supported on k? Just uh, a part. So now I'm going to consider, say, in some sense, the orthogonal complement to this new on K. I mean, I'm going to consider any measure which kills any element of this space here. So we take we take any any mu, any measure mu. Okay, measure with sign, space and k, such that it kills it kills any f here of mu uh, in the in the in the space of finite linear combination. Let's take this. Any measure which kills the whole space of finite linear combinations in this set. Okay. Now, So now we define the following function. Find this F, capital F, at any point X this way. It's just the convolution of the Green's function of the of Laplacian plus one with this mesh. Okay, which is compactly supported. Okay, so this is well defined. And actually, exercise, okay, because I don't have time, I have to work a bit. <laughs> Only stupid. So, uh, check, uh, please, that exercise. Check that this function this is a good function. This f is in L1 block. L1 block. Rn. First thing to check. And second, Compute the Laplacian 
plus 1 is L. And in the sense of distributions, this is mu. This is the mu. Assuming this, what you have is the following. You have two properties. This F has two properties. So we notice that, so first point, uh, F is equal to zero. F is equal to zero on, on the set uh, U. Recall that. So remember, I erased uh, the, the picture, but remember that this uh, new space of finite linear combinations, this meant uh, poles, the poles uh, are contained, are contained uh, in this set U. Okay. This is the complement of the ball. And uh, by the definition, by the very definition of the measure, by the very definition, so the measure kills. The measure, the measure kills any Green's function whose pole x in this case is on u. So this means that f is equal to zero on the set u by the very definition of the of the measure. because we have taken mu to do this in the complement of, the, of all the linear combinations, finite linear combinations with poles here. And F is defined precisely this way, with convolution with G. And second, second is that uh, the Laplacian F plus F is equal to zero in uh, in the complement of the support. So the support of mu, we said, is contained in k. So this is equal to 0 in Rn, Rn minus k. Okay. So in particular, this implies, so this solves the, this elliptic PDE in Rn minus k. So in particular, by elliptic regularity, it's smooth, but it's more than smooth. Actually, F is analytic. F is real analytic in this set, in Rn minus k. OK? So with this, we are almost done. that now observe that if we have a point y which is not contained uh, in k then uh, sorry sorry and this by step so first this implies that now let's use the assumption so since since uh, rn minus k is connected by the function, connected by the assumption, okay. and and of course contains u this set. Then the analyticity of f. Function f in this set, f in Rn minus k, it implies that if f is equal to 0 in Rn minus k. 
So you have k, and you have your set u. You have that, that your function, that your function uh, is zero on u. Here is zero, and it is analytic. In, in all the space except for here, of course. Here it's not here you have the measure, so it's not analytic here, but here it's analytic. So this zero is transmitted everywhere in this set, in R n minus two. If you don't have analyticity because your uh, operator, your elliptic operator has say non-analytic coefficients, you invoke now uh, a unique continuation. And again by unique continuation if your solution is identically zero on an open set, then it will be zero in, uh, in all the region which is connected with this open set and, and where the measure is not supported. Okay. So then, with this, we can, we can finish the, the proof of the balayage of this claim. So yes, we finish in the following way. So now, let's take a point which is not contained in the compact set K. If Y is not contained in K, then we said that F of Y is zero. F is zero in the complement of K, so F of Y is zero. But the definition of F, remember, is this one here. Let's write it again. It's simply the integral of this. So, in particular, this means that mu heals, mu annihilates the Green's function, Green's function with pole y, provided that y is not in k. Okay. So for any Green's function which has a pole in the complement of K, it's annihilated by the measure. Okay. So then the measure also annihilates U2. Remember U2, who is U2? Probably we've forgotten all the definitions that I introduced before. I forgotten myself even. So U2 is uh, it was a linear combination of Green's function. So remember now that remember U2 was a linear combination, linear combination of Green's functions, Green's functions with poles uh, on the complement uh, of K on Rn Rn minus. Okay, so then it's annihilated by the measure. Okay, because the measure annihilates all these functions in the components for uh, with Paul. And now uh, <laughs> the magic of Hambanner. Well, now the, the idea, of course, is that say in some if this were a finite dimensional setting, just standard linear algebra, but we have proved uh, we have analyzed. Uh, we have considered the orthogonal complement of uh, of your uh, functions with linear combinations of Green's functions with linear, uh, which are linear combinations which follows here. This this mu is anything in the orthogonal complement, and we proved that this u two is also in is in the orthogonal complement of this. So then, in the in linear algebra, this would mean that this u two is a linear combination of functions here because it's in the in the orthogonal complement of the measure. Here, it is, it's infinite dimensional setting, etc. So Han Banach, what Han Banach means is that is that u two can be uniformly approximated. U two. Uniformly approximated in K 
I elements of this space new. And the space new is the set of linear combinations we pose here. So we are done. We have proved that we have moved the pose. We have proved that uh, this U2, which has poles here, in this region, remember in the, in the annular region, the poles of this U2 are here. So the poles of U2 are here, D don't touch K. We have proved then this is this corona, this annular region is connected with U. So then this is killed. So then U2 itself is killed by the measure, by, by any measure orthogonal to the. That's why I'm talking about uh, say somehow orthogonal complement of uh, of the space new that I introduce here. It's, uh, the new is the space of all linear combinations here. And the quotations, the orthogonal complement of mu is equal to all these measures mu that I consider in here. Okay, somehow. So it uh, so then you can apply Han Banach and to conclude that U2 can be approximated is not in general a linear combination of elements in U, but it can be approximated uniformly by elements in U. And that, and this finishes uh, the proof of the claim. Okay, we have moved the poles from here to here. Okay, somehow. Okay, so this is uh, this is the balayage. This is the balayage. So if there are some questions, if not, there's a still some more work to do to finish uh, the proof of the theorem, of the global approximation theorem. Yes, but was it clear, more or less, how we are moving the poles using this? Uh, <coughs> it's an abstract argument, just uh, using a And when I hear that the two main ingredients were, um, uh, were unique continuation or analyticity in the case of Hempholz, is the first and second to simplify things. Here uh, we are using uh, the symmetry of the Green's function, but in general it's not needed. You, can, you don't need to have formal symmetric operators to do this. But then you, you, you should be careful with the adjoint of the operator. So, just, uh, well, I don't have finished to, I don't have time to finish the proof of the theorem, but just Let's summarize uh, what we have, and we'll finish the, the global approximation theorem uh, tomorrow. <coughs> so let's see, because we have so many functions that <laughs> So we started, so let's see which functions we have. So we started, so so we have set K contains uh, this N. This is the compact set. Compact, this is the open matrix. Okay. And here, uh, at the beginning, what we have is B, your local solution. So that's it. Then what we did is just uh, uh, say a brute force extension. A brute force extension. And I call this U1. Simply multiply, multiplying by the cutoff function. But now, of course, this U1 it doesn't solve the PD. We wrote, we, we, uh, we wrote this U1 as the sum of two functions. A function A plus a function U prime 1. This is solution to the homogeneous equation. This indeed solves the equation, the homogeneous equation. But, and this U1 prime is explicit in the sense that it's convolution with the, it's convolution with the Green's function. 
of F, F was the Laplacian plus one of this U1 uh, the density. Okay. So then, what we did is that we got rid of the integral here in this convolution because we approximated the integral by Riemann sums. You can see this in many ways, either as a direct approximation of integral by, by sum, or either as approximation of a measure with time by deltas, this is always possible, or either using a partition of unity, or of the NR in some sense analogous ways of looking at this, but at the end of the day, what you have <coughs> is that, is that uh, you approximate, now that all this is exact, now we have approximation, approximation, by H, H remains the same, we don't touch it, plus H plus U2, and this is three minus sums. So this is uh, all this linear combination, linear combination, Green's functions, Green's functions, which falls on the set uh, n minus k. Okay, in this corona, in this angular region. So then we claim. Uh, this uh, balayage of uh, poles, we said that we can move the poles which belong to this region, this annular region. So we have the annular region here, the poles are here. And now, for some reasons, you'll see tomorrow why, I want to move them. And I move them uh, away certain ball, okay, containing it, and I move the poles here. Okay, so now we get a function for still H plus, I call this new function U3, again approximation, approximation, and U3 is also a linear combination of Green's functions, but now the poles are not in the corona, but are here. Okay. So this is finite linear combination, finite linear combination of Green's functions, With poles and all the complement of the ball. Rn minus R. Okay, even you can fix uh, the set in the complement that you want. So, so I will stop now. So tomorrow I use uh, I use uh, I work with this U3. So now there are two ways of following or, or proving the result. Uh, with the first technique, say, that I'm not going to follow here, you just push this set U to infinity. You start to move poles, so you consider a sequence of U's going far away and far away, and controlling the errors, making the approximation better and better in the compacted case. You move, you move, you move. And then, with this sequence, you finally, in the limit, you prove convergence in compact sets, and you prove that there exists a global solution to the equation without any singularity, because you have pushed all the singularities towards infinity. So you are done. But the point is that in the cone or region or, or uh, half space or whatever that you've used to move the poles, you don't have control of growth at infinity. Say, uh, for example, let's think of uh, some region here where you are pushing the poles. Then in this region, your function is not bounded in general. You don't control. So here I'll follow a different procedure, which is, okay, we are not going to to push things at infinity, let's uh, keep this uh, pose here. And now uh, I consider a different uh, technique, which is another representation using Fourier vessel series. You'll see how we do it. We, we, we do it, which is very specific, very specific for Helmholtz equation and also for a few other PDEs, but in this particular case, Helmholtz, and which, give, which will give you uh, decay at infinity. But this will be tomorrow. Okay, thank you. I'm finished. <laughs>